Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code Know How. And by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with free step by step repair guides, high quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll ever need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout. This week on Know How, bandage your heart bleed, check out a brand spanking new router, and we're going to tell you how to speed up your Windows 7 or 8 computer for free. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we bend, build, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to take you through some of the projects that we've been working on, some of the quick tips that we've been coming up with, and uh, talk all about a nasty, nasty web vulnerability. Mm. You ready for that? Yeah, I've been hearing a lot about it. But yeah. I don't understand it at all. Heartbleed, heartbleed. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about heartbleed. When we talk about heartbleed, what we're talking about is a vulnerability within OpenSSL, which is a subset of SSL as we know it, Secure Sockets Layer, which actually translated into TLS. Now, when mm -hmm. we're talking about TLS, we're talking about what happens when my client makes a secure connection to a mm -hmm. server, and I'm losing you, huh? What? Yeah. No. Yeah. It's got a catchy name. It's got a catchy I have no idea what you're saying. Here's the problem. I think the media has been over explaining it. They like to get into techno babble. In fact, we've been doing that too. I I'm, I've been guilty of it. I tried explaining Heartbeat on Padre's Corner and I said I was going to do it in English and then people yeah. said I 30 you know, minutes later still don't 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 <laughs> yeah. get it. Okay. okay. All right. So let me break it down to you. As simple as I can make it, right. you're a server. Okay. okay, and that's your system memory. So that's what you've got. You've got a nice little set of uh, jelly beans, which represent mm. the memory you've got stored within your RAM. Correct. Got quite a bit of memory in there. All right. Okay. Now I've got a secure connection to you. So right. you're like Facebook, and that means that I get that little lock in the upper corner of right. my uh, of my browser. Right. It tells me that our our connection secure, is encrypted. Yeah. Secure. No one is can that eavesdrop. HTTPS. Or something? Yeah. HTTPS. But here's the problem. You can't just keep those connections on forever. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to drop them if they're no longer in use. Okay. The problem is the way that we make sure that you keep the connection is we send what's called a heartbeat. Hmm. A heartbeat is just a, it's a simple packet. It's a, it's, right. it's a little bit of information that goes from me to the server and it says, hey, I'm still here, I'm still alive, don't drop the connection. And the server is supposed to send me back the exact same thing I sent to it, okay. so I receive it and I know the server's gonna keep me alive. Okay, a little handshake. A little handshake, yeah. right? Yeah. All right, so this, this jelly bean right here. Looks this, delicious. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, eat that all, right. all right, don't eat this, all the props. This one <laughs> is the heartbeat, okay? Okay. Now, what I have to do is I have to actually include this in my, my, heart sh my handshake to you, my heartbeat, okay. right? But I also have to tell you in the signature how big this is. Okay. Okay, that's how, that's how this heartbeat works. All right, so I say, I'm sending you one jelly bean. Send me one jelly bean back. So I take this and I give, give it to you. Jelly bean. It goes on top of your pile of jelly beans. Boop. And then you say, okay, okay. I've received one jelly bean. I'm going to send the send same. It back. Exactly. And I get it back. Bam. That's the heartbeat. Okay. Okay. That keeps open this connection so you know that I want to stay connected to you, right? All right. All right. Now, Every other implementation of SSL, other than OpenSSL, does a quick check because I have to tell you how many I'm, I'm passing, right? Right. All other SSL will actually look at what it's receiving, look at what you told me I was receiving, and make sure the two are the same. So if I say, here's one jelly bean, it will look and say, oh yeah, that's okay. one jelly bean. Yeah. I'll send it to you. Sounds good. OpenSSL missed that step. It's too trusting. It's too trusting. So what happens is, <laughs> okay. I can do this. Go go to the wide shot. Here's, uh, I'm going to say, all right, th this is a jelly bean, right? One jelly bean, please. I'm sending you 64,000 jelly beans. Well, this kind of only looks like one jelly bean. Yeah, but, but you're you an know open what? SL, so you don't I care. I believe you. So, so I'm going to send you all the jelly beans back. Right, exactly. <laughs> so that's in a heartbeat. In a, in a 
<laughs> jelly bean case, that's what heartbeat is. And the exploit is that the person can do it over and over and over until they... I can do it over and over again, and I can just keep slowly advancing my pointer until eventually I have all of your jelly beans. Okay. I have all your system memory, I have everything. <laughs> all your jelly beans belong to all us. All your jelly beans are belong to me. Mm. And that, in essence, is what Heartbleed is. And huh. you just ate my jelly bean. Well, well what else are they gonna do with it? <sighs> Man, there goes system security. <laughs> I've been patched. Yeah. Now, I mean, see, uh, that's, that's really the simplified version of, of what's going on in Heartbleed. Uh, there's a lot of technical stuff that goes in the background, and I actually really love it. I, I, I can, you can actually see, they, they isolated the piece of code that is responsible for the Heartbleed bug. And it is a fascinating read, huh. but if all you want to know is how Heartbleed works, that's, that's the, it. The basics of it. That's the basics. I guess the scary thing is, is that it's been around for so long and nobody yeah. caught on to it for a while. It's been around for two years, so yeah. it's it's been in the wild. The thing is that no one just, no one figured to, to check on OpenSSL. I mean, OpenSSL, I, I, I'm actually a big proponent of, of uh, open, open source, source software, software, right? Yeah. So. We do peer review. Everyone looks at everyone else's code. And so it's kind of unthinkable that something like this went on for two years before, without anyone catching on. Yeah, well, it is kind of scary, but I guess we know now. Yeah. And later on, we'll show some of the steps that we can take to, if you have had been compromised, to secure yourself. Right, right. Because, we're, because I mean, this is cool. This explanation is cool. Right. But, but the real problem here is once that server has been compromised, then, once someone has emptied out the system memory, they could have all the encryption keys. They could have your server certificate. Yeah. They could have anything that was in system memory. So if it, was, if it was processing data, they have that data. If it was processing usernames and passwords, they have those usernames and passwords. More importantly, Importantly, if they have those encryption keys, it means that someone could do what's called a man-in-the-middle attack, mm. where they pretend, like again, you're Facebook, I pretend I'm Facebook, all of someone else's traffic will route through me, go to you, and back. Here's the and, jelly beans. And yeah, yeah. I, got, I get your jelly beans. I get to look at them as I pass them back and forth, yeah. and you can't tell that I'm doing that. Yeah, that's kind of scary. That's kind of scary. And uh, the biggest problem is that People use the same usernames and passwords for many of their websites, so... Not a good idea. Not a good idea. And you're going to help us with that. We're going to have a solution for that later on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But before we get to that, before we get to the, the bandage for the heart bleed, I promised my fans on Twitter that I would show you a quick, down and dirty, easy way to get back up to 10% of your system performance if you're using Windows 7 or Windows 8. Nice. Shall we take a look? Yeah, let's do that. Sorry about that. Now we all like speed. We long for it. We crave it. We want it in our PCs, in our laptops, our Macs, our devices. Pretty much anything that can go faster, we want it to go faster. And so we spend a lot of money. We spend a lot of time building and breaking and upgrading and replacing all in the quest for speed. But what if I told you, Windows 7 and 8 users, that there was a way for you to get up to 10% of your speed back without upgrading anything, without replacing anything, without really changing the way you use Windows or even opening up the case. Now, I know it sounds like a pipe dream. I know it sounds too good to be true. But folks, this is something that I've been doing since Windows 7 dropped on the world. Now, the tip centers around two services that are always running in the background of Windows 7 and Windows 8. The first is called Remote Assistance. Now, technically, the feature is very, very cool. It sits in the background and it waits for someone to connect to your computer and use their keyboard and mouse to show you how to fix something that's going wrong with your computer. Again, nice feature, but I'd be willing to bet that very few of us have ever actually used it. So if we're not using it, why let it sit in the background using up your resources? The second service is called System Restore. Now, th this actually is a very useful service that allows you to create save points that you can jump back to. So if you bork your system, you always have an easy way to go back to an image that was clean. Here's the problem, though. Very few of us have safe System Restore points. Very few of us have actually done the work to make sure that we've got the save points where we want them. And so we're normally going to go back to the original factory image. Well, if we're going to do that, we've got the factory installed disk. We've got the factory installed partition. We normally have some sort of way to go back to how it was when we first received the computer. If that's what we're going to do, and especially I'd, I'd suggest you do that if you get a virus, then why even have that running? Well, let me show you how to turn them off. The first thing you need to do is get to the system option in control panel. I usually just right click the computer icon in the desktop and choose properties. 
Once in the system menu, you'll see all the stats on your computer, but to the left of the stats, you'll see Control Panel Home, along with four shielded options. Click Remote Settings. You'll see a field for Allow Remote Assistance Connections to this computer. Go ahead and uncheck that box, then click Apply. You've just turned off the Remote Assistance service, but now we need to shut off System Protection. In the Control Panel, there is a tab for System Protection. Go ahead and select that. You'll notice under Protection Settings that it will tell you if one of your drives is protected. Usually it protects the drive with the operating system, but not the others. Select the drive that is protected, then click Configure. Now select the radio button to turn off system protection and apply the change. That's it. You've just turned off the two background services and recovered all the horsepower that had been going to feed those two services. Now I'm sure there's some of you who are skeptical that you can actually get up to 10% of your horsepower back, so I ran PC Mark Vantage before and after the changes. With the services on, this PC scored 13,394. After I ran the benchmark again, making just these two changes, the PC scored 14,578. If you do the math, that's a 9% increase, all without buying, upgrading, or installing anything. I'm Father Robert Ballasare, the Digital Jesuit, and now that you know how to take your horsepower back, go do it. Now, now Brian, you can overdo this. In fact, I know yeah. a lot of people who do overdo this. They, they like turn off all the services that they possibly can. Right, I've been a victim of that. Yeah, yeah which that. it's just good. You know, it's good to turn off things that you don't need, but. Yeah, you, you can go too far and suddenly there's not a service there that you need right. to, you know, for that off thing that every once in a while happens. And then happens. you reboot and you wonder what the heck has happened to my system. Right. And so that's why I chose these two services. These two services are actually really cool features, mm -hmm. but I'd be willing to gather that 99% of us have never used a remote assistance and at least 75% of us have never used System Restore. So if that's the case, if you're not going to use those things, you might as well, you know, take them out. Very rarely. I was even, actually, this weekend, I was thinking about formatting my computer, and System Restore, I never used it, and most of the stuff I back up to external hard drives, it's like, ah. Yeah, and, if, and for me, the only thing that really makes me think about reinstalling or going back to a previous version is if I think some way my system has been compromised or right. I installed something and it's messing it up. And in those in those instances, I, I never want to use System Restore because it doesn't quite clean everything. And it doesn't always... It doesn't always fix yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't get rid of everything. Right, yeah. so I just I just go back to the fresh factory fresh install. Yeah. It, it's, it's also, I kind of like that. I, I mean, maybe it's just because I'm a Windows user. Yeah. But every once in a while, you know, every 18 months or so, I like to reset everything because, not necessarily because the, the Windows is messed up, no. but because of all the junk I've added on. Right, and it's right. It's a clean house. It's nice to just start fresh, and then the way I do it is I just add things as I need them. Like, I'm not going to use Premiere this week. I'll, you know, install it next week when I'm going to be editing something. So. Right, right. Well, you know, this is great, and uh, I think I had way too many jelly beans. Uh, I, I ate, a little sick. I, you know, <laughs> I ate too much system memory. But I thought this might be a good time to talk about our first sponsor. Now, uh, Brian, have you ever heard of... Squarespace? I have. I'm a user of Squarespace. Really? What, what, what do you use them for? I will not shamelessly plug myself, but I have a website that I use for Squarespace. Yeah. And yeah. It's, I like it because I can just focus on putting my content on the web. I don't have to think about anything else. Well, you know, what I've always liked about Squarespace is that it is an all-in-one platform. You know, it really is a turnkey solution. Sometimes, uh, and I, I will admit to this, I have a service right now that I use that just provides service, and I use someone else to provide the package I put on top of it. And I even use a third party to give me a rock-solid back-end database. Mm -hmm. Well, what if I told you you could get all those things at one place for one price for, uh, you know, that almost never goes down? Well, I believe you because I use it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Which is why we are proud to say that Squarespace is a sponsor of KnowHow. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want to publish a website? Do you want to make it easy for your clients to see your portfolio? Well, if so, you need to use Squarespace. It's a great way to share a weekend project blog or provide the ability to jumpstart a side startup project with a professional looking site and the ability to quickly and easily take orders and sell creations. Now some of the reasons that you'll love Squarespace would be that they are constantly improving their platform. They are not one of these companies that just sells you the service and leaves you alone. They are always adding new features, new designs, and even better support. They also offer flexibility. This is important for DIYers, you know, the core audience of know-how. There are sets of tools to create your own website without code from design tools like Layout Engine and the Logo Creator, a platform for customization, especially if you know enough code to get under the hood 
since the developer platform is super robust. Squarespace also has beautiful designs. They have 25 templates for you to start with and recently added a logo creator tool, which is a basic tool for individuals and small businesses with limited resources to create a simple identity for themselves. Now, Squarespace is also easy to use. If you want some help, Squarespace has live chat and email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but I, I almost guarantee you, you're not gonna need them. They have a completely redesigned customer help site for easier access to help, uh, to, to give you self-help articles and video workshops but in my experience, it's so easy, it's so intuitive. Those things are good to have, but you're not gonna have to break them out because Squarespace makes your projects that much easier. Squarespace also gives you e-commerce, now available for all subscription plan levels, including the ability to accept donations, which is great for nonprofits, cash, wedding registers, and school fund drives. It starts at just $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. Now, the new Squarespace metric app for iPhone and iPad allows you to check site stats like page views, unique visitors, and social media followers. With the blog app, you can make text updates, tap and drag images to change layouts, and monitor comments on the go. Now, even their code is beautiful. We all know that Squarespace looks beautiful on the outside, but what is also amazing is that the code inside is beautiful. I've actually taken a look at it, and it's just so well done. Their auto-generation tools are, are spot on. Squarespace takes as much pride in their back-end code as they do in their front-end design, and that just tells me that they pay attention to what they're doing. Now again, hosting is included. They take care of it so that you'll never have to pay a separate subscription fee to keep your blog up. You pay one fee each month and be done with it. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Squarespace with a free two-week trial with no credit card required. Start building your website. Now, when you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use their offer code, KNOWHOW, to get 10% off and to show your support for KNOWHOW. We thank Squarespace for their support of KNOWHOW. A better website awaits. Start with Squarespace. Now, Brian. Padre. So we talked a little bit about Heartbleed. Yep. Talked a little bit about how to speed up our Windows machines. That's right. Now I want to know if there's a way to protect myself from those nasty, nasty vulnerabilities I find on the uh, on the internet. Well, fortunately, there is. And it's probably something you should have done even before this Heartbleed thing came out, and that's use different passwords for websites. Something that, I mean, I'm ashamed to say that I've, I've used the same password for multiple sites. I've used throwaway passwords and usernames and things like that, and it's not a good idea. It's true, it's true. And you know what, the, the sad part is, I think we all at a base level understand why we should be using different passwords. Right. But it's so difficult. I mean, if you're, if you're doing 20, 30 different websites, web services, everything from your social media to your credit cards to your banking to like vacation yeah. sites, whatever it might be, it can be a pain to remember the different password that you chose. Even if, like me, each password is sort of a like a like mutation. An, an incremation, yeah, yeah, incremation of the it's, next one. Yeah. It's still, it's too easy to forget. So yeah, I, I will admit, <laughs> A couple of websites out there have the same username and password. Uh, well, the product that I'm going to tell you about is called LastPass, and it's something that I think a lot of people here at the studio use. I know Leo has, and uh, Steve Gibson on Security Now has personally vetted it. So he's, I mean, if he says it's okay, I'll go with what he says. But if you want like a more in-depth uh, explanation and stuff, you can definitely check out uh, twit.tv slash sn for security now. They did a couple episodes about Heartbleed and about LastPass, which is what we are gonna be showing here. And this is just a little, their little advertisement for the product, but basically That's it, how I look whenever yeah, I'm putting yeah. in passwords. Start hitting your head yeah, against do, the keyboard. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a service that you use one password to unlock your password vault, and then that is where you keep all your encrypted passwords. And this is all done locally, and from the way Steve has explained it, is that LastPass doesn't even know what your uh, passwords are. Um, it's all done locally on the machine, and so the only person that has access to your passwords should be you. Just don't forget your one main password that you use for it. Um, so we'll just run through a quick setup of what to do, and it's um, you can use it for free, but there is a $12 uh, fee if you want to use some of the other premium services that they have, but we'll just go over it real quick. So if you look at my laptop, this is the website, and it's really pretty basic to use. Um, 
When you download it, what it'll do is it'll install itself as an extension on your browser. So I use Chrome, I use Safari, I use Firefox, and it has an extension for all of those products. And it also does mobile devices. So it runs just on basically everything. So Windows, uh, OS, you know, OS 10, uh, Linux, and as far as mobile OSs, iOS, Android, even BlackBerry and Windows Phone. Yeah, I, so. I now noticed this. I actually I installed LastPass not too long ago. I mean, it was before Heartbleed, but mm -hmm. I wanted to give it a go, and I, it, is, it surprised me how easy it was to install. I've used it for about four years now, and I, so I have about like 180 sites that I use it for. So whenever I go on a new site, like I have my regular email that I use, but then I generate, it has a great uh, password generator, which I can show up here. So when you do uh, install it, it'll just pop up as a little extension in the top right corner of your screen. It looks like a little red asterisk. And it's got, so I've got my vault, which I'm not gonna open. <laughs> oh, no, come on, open it up, let's go. <laughs> what but, could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> with showing all your usernames and passwords to the internet. Oh, yeah, well, you can't actually see my passwords. Um, you actually, you would, even if you go into, say I'm gonna edit my Kickstarter password or something, this is the interface. Uh, so you can't even see it just, like this. This is if you went into a website to edit it. If I click that, you would see my password. But I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> but anyway, so you've got your vault. And in some of the settings, uh, it's pretty basic. Yeah. You, know, you know, one of the things that I found about LastPass is it's just a really good way to organize your sites. I mean, even yeah, you know, beyond the password stuff, I, I don't think most people realize how many places they've left credentials on. Right. You know, especially if you're you're really just sort of starting up, you you throw a username on this, you throw a username on that. And before right. you know it, I, I, I've come back like three years later and started to sign up for a new account and realize I already have an account here. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, if I had then, LastPass set up that way, I'd know. Oh, okay, I've got accounts here, 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 and these are my credentials. It's a great way of keeping track of what sites you've made usernames for, yeah. and then also like when you come to a site, and you're like, I know it was an increment of one of my passwords, but <laughs> uh, now I'm locked out. I have no idea. Oh, it was a capital P. I forgot. I put a P in there, and da da da. da. Yeah. <laughs> that LastPass gets rid of all that. Yeah. Um, but so like, if I go to a website like Kickstarter, if it loads here. What will happen is when you go to log into the site, uh, LastPass fills out the username and password um, for you. But of course, as I do this live, nothing loads up because of our great Wi-Fi. That's why I'm plugged into the. What you? Have, oh well, I don't have that option. I can't hardwire into the Wi-Fi or to the internet. But anyway, once the site loads, once that loads up, now no, okay. Here's a question that I know a lot of people have, which is. Wait a minute, I've always been told never to write my passwords down. I've always been told that I don't <laughs> want to have one file that has everything because then if people get that file, they'll have all that of my accounts. That is true. Cause so, I mean, you're consolidating everything into one place, right? It's all on your device. You're right. So, I mean, there is that danger that you're putting all your eggs in one basket, but it's a lot better than trying to write, like, write it yeah. down. So. Yeah. And also, I would say this. We are at the point where <laughs> there are so many usernames and so many passwords. And remember, you should be using unique usernames and passwords for everything that the security benefit of having them all <gasps> different, having all your usernames and passwords unique, outweigh the disadvantages of having everything contained within one space. I mean, and it is, it is encrypted. Someone will need to know the, the password for LastPass. They'll right. be able to have access to your device. And so, yeah, you just got to weigh the pros and the cons. I'd say, by and far, it's worth it to make sure that even if one website gets compromised, it's not going to affect everything else. Right. And... Like, I just, oh shoot, it's just not working for me trying to log into a site, so I'm not even going to try and show that right now. But um, one thing that it does that's really nice is it will audit your sites too and give you a security score. So it'll run through your list of sites and your passwords, find the duplicates for you. And last night I even went through mine because my score was not great, not terrible either, but my score was 51 Point two percent, and I was three hundred thousand. Wait, how does that score? How does that score? Yeah. So like, what, what what does fifty one point two percent mean? That's how secure my list of websites and passwords is, and it goes through, um, like when it finds a, 
a duplicate password to a website, oh, okay. or it finds score. a password that doesn't have any numbers or any like you know asterisks or anything. Special characters. Special characters. It, that gives you like a really low score on that password. When you use a completely random generated password that LastPass gives you, that's like you know yeah, ninety eight yeah. percent. And, and actually, you know, I think that's something that we should talk about in concert with talking about LastPass and keeping unique usernames and IDs, and that is. If you're going to use a service like LastPass, or as Shivers in the chat room points out, there are a few others. There's there's one pass and a few other services that do the exact same same thing. If you're going to be using that, you no longer need to remember passwords, right? Right. So there's you no to need to remember your one password. You, yeah, exactly. You remember the one password from LastPass, and everything else can be absolute gibberish. Uh, I know I've I've always used passwords that are a combination of something I know and something that I've I've randomly generated. Right. But with something like LastPass, where I don't actually have to memorize it, I can make it truly strange. It could, yeah. Special characters galore, or capitals and lowercase as numbers and letters. It, it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to have to type it in. I'm just going to be able to use LastPass to drop it in the site when I need access. Right. And it, when you go to a site to make a new password or change your password, uh, which I have to put mine in my master password in here for a sec. Um, it's really easy to generate new passwords. And let's see. Is it connecting now? I don't know. Well, so if you look I at gave the him my connection. <laughs> yeah. I sacrificed my computer. Uh, thank you, MacBook Air. Um, so, like, if you look up here, you can even change the a number of characters that you use in your password that when you generate one. And these are just completely random. Ran completely random. And it shows the strength of the password and stuff. And a lot of times when I use these passwords uh, on a website, it's like, this is a great password. This is completely random. And you can use special characters, make it pronounceable. It gives you a lot of options for that sort of thing. But I usually just I do a random password and make sure to save it. And if you're worried about when you're making a new account, make sure to copy it real quick and then make your account and then double check um, after you've created your uh, your new uh, profile for that right. site, because sometimes I've I've made a generated password for a site and I forgot to save it. Oops. But fortunately, LastPass does have a thing with um, it shows recently used like and history. recently yeah. like generated. Passwords. So that's like kind of a quick tip: is it shows recently used and recently generated um, passwords, so you can get back to that. Now I, I will say this. Um, Maybe I know someone who has done black hatting in the past. I'm just some, some <laughs> someone guy. off the top of your head. And there are some tools out there that that are really, really good at taking a password list, a username and a password list, and just checking them against all major sites. It's just it's a batch file. Basically, you dump a b bunch of data in, and it tries it out against everything. There are options in some of the better tools mm -hmm. that will tell it to ignore obviously random generated passwords. Mm, because they're so difficult? Be, well, just because if, it, if they see something that looks like a completely randomly generated password, mm -hmm. the, the chances are that they've used randomly generated passwords for all their sites, so that's, and, a, that's a low hit. So it will actually move those to the back. Uh -huh. The ones that I always, uh, that this person always focused on were the ones that looked like words, were the ones that looked like some sort of mnemonic phrase that the person was using, yeah. because then I know they've probably used that on multiple sites. And uh, if I would not use your master LastPass password for anything else other than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so pro tip, pro yeah, tip, pro if you're tip. gonna use LastPass, remember the one password you absolutely need to protect is the last pass password. That doesn't right. go anywhere, that stays in your head, done. And the final nice thing about LastPass, um, there are alter alternatives out there, but uh, we're gonna focus on LastPass right now, and that is the mobile app for LastPass. So, you know, a lot of my apps on my phone, I've kept the password basic, because when I'm on my phone, I just wanna type it in real quick. But now LastPass, uh, a couple weeks ago, updated, and you can use it to you used to kind of have to copy it from right. their app and then paste it into the app that you wanted to log into. But now it does a little overlay and it helps you uh, log into whatever app you want to use. So if you, let's see. So I logged out of Instagram, for example, and I generated a new password last night for it, which I could not type in even if I really wanted to. And so now that I've gone into the app, LastPass pops up with this little pop-up here. Ah, got so it. I don't even have to go into the LastPass, well, now it disappeared. No, well, now because uh, you waited too long. I waited too long. So, <laughs> but if 
Yeah, so it, pa it pops up with this little prompt. So you have to give the master password, and then it automatically fills in the password for that site. Right, so as long as I can remember my master password, which I'm going to type in right now. Now nope. type it on camera. Nothing bad could happen, I promise you. <laughs> I trust Padre. Yeah, trust, trust the Padre. <laughs> she would never steer me wrong. So as I quickly type in my LastPass password. You know what would be good, though, if we had a mm -hmm. program that would save your password for your LastPass? <laughs> you think so? A, a LastPass for a your last, LastPass? A LastPass, LastPass. Ah, uh, timed out. Dang it. I waited too long. <laughs> I was talking to you too much. Sorry. No, we get it, though. We get it. We understand. So you type in your master password, and it's automatically going to fill in the password for whatever site it's currently on. I, I, and actually, I have to say, the, the mobile integration for LastPass is, is probably second to none. So now it's got my, I can fill the form with my Instagram password, and now I can log in. So, oh, and there's Josh. Oh, my. Ah. Ooh. Whoa. Oh. Oh. Ah. So I don't know why I ever want to use this program anymore. Yeah, you should probably but, delete that. But anyway, that makes it really easy for logging into mobile apps. So I've used it for, like, everything now. Now, we're probably going to have to revisit this subject because, again, there are other services out there. Uh, how much does LastPass cost? LastPass is $12. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a dollar a month is what they yeah. say. And um, then we have to satisfy everyone in there. I know that uh, there's people in the chat room who use uh, OnePass, and OnePass is... Is thirty four ninety nine I think for a year. Um, yeah, and, and there is an open source. There's KeyPass. KeyPass, which yeah. works. I mean, don't, I, I'm not going to knock open source. KeyPass actually works, and I I, I kind of like the interface on KeyPass. I know there's a lot of people who, uh, they they no. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I just I've been using LastPass for a while, and it's not it's not terribly expensive, and for the convenience that it allows me. You use what you trust. Yeah, I use what I trust, and. You know, Steve Gibson gave it his thumbs up, and it's a lot better than what my grandma used to do, and that's type in your, her passwords in a doc and then save it to the desktop and label it passwords. No, that always works. So, it's like, no, oh, I can't do that anymore, grandma. <laughs> I actually, I, I have a family member who used to put uh, her passwords into an email draft <laughs> no. on Yahoo Mail no. and just <laughs> leave it in the draft folder so she would always know it's there. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's totally secure. It's, it's, oh, yeah. It's a good idea. Thanks for the spam mail. Now, again, you use what you trust. And speaking of who you trust, uh, who do we trust for tools? Oh, when I'm taking stuff apart? Yeah. I have to be iFixit. iFixit, yeah. Now, we here on the show, we're big fans of iFixit. They've been with us since the beginning. And, you know, they get us. They understand what we're trying to do with know-how. We're trying to be able to hack. We're trying to be able to upgrade. We're trying to be able to open things up so we understand how they work. And iFixit, well, they get it. Now, iFixit is a free online repair manual and toolkit for everything. They have more than 10,000 repair guides for everything from electronics like your smartphone, tablet, and game console to your home appliance, your clothing, and even, yeah, your bike. They have also have foolproof instructions to fix all your stuff. If you've shattered your iPhone screen, need to repair the red ring of death on your Xbox, or swap the battery on your Galaxy S3, iFixit has got you covered with those parts, those tools, and those repair guides to make it easy. Now, today we're introducing two new iFixit tools, the ProTech screwdriver set and the Magnetic Project Mat. Now, you've seen the Magnetic Project Mat. It's, it's this wonderful little device that lets you stick your screws on and, and then make little Sharpie or, or dry erase marks next to it so you know where they're going. But this is the thing that's, that's gotten me excited. This is their smaller version of the iFixit toolkit. It's all the tools you need, but in half the space. Now, the ProTech screwdriver set is a one screwdriver set to rule them all. You get 15 Ooh. screwdrivers specifically chosen for the iFixit teardown. These drivers can handle more than 90% of electronic repairs. They're designed for heavy use and delicate precision, which means that you can get those really hard to reach small specialty screws and also crank down whenever you need to, to get out a, a stuck bolt. Now they have black oxide tips for increased grip, durability, and corrosion resistance, and a flexed blade swivel top design for added precision. Now, their custom tool roll makes this a handy portable toolkit for amateurs and professional fixers alike. And, of course, like most iFixit stuff, it comes with a lifetime warranty. You break one of these babies in the line of service, and iFixit will replace it. Now, this comes for fifty of uh, uh, fifty nine ninety five, which is actually a steal when you consider everything that we've been able to do with these toolkits. If you've ever seen a project on Know How. 99% of the time, it's, it's been using these, these drivers, these tools from an iFixit toolkit. That's why, you know, we like them. They're not just a sponsor. They're our tools of choice. 
Now here's what we want you to do. We want you to try iFixit. We want to see if maybe they are the source for all the tools, repair guides, and information you need to tear down the electronics that you're trying to upgrade. Right now, with iFixit, you can fix it yourself. Visit iFixit.com slash twit for more than 10,000 free step-by-step -step guides. iFixit also sells every part and tool that you'll need. Enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout, and you'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. That's iFixit.com slash twit. And we thank iFixit for their support of know-how. I mean, you, you use iFixit all, all the time, right? I just like to take things apart sometimes. Not necessarily am I able to put them back together. But yeah, and iFixit makes it super easy. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, one of the things that I really liked in the larger kit are those spudgers. Yeah. Uh, I, I will admit, I, I've kind of, I'm not, I'm a barbarian when I take things apart. I normally just put a flat screwdriver in there and kind of crank it until something right. breaks yeah. or it opens up. Well, you know when you come back with a handful of those USBs from the conventions and stuff? Right, I right. like to just pry them apart and take them apart and see like how they, if they just have the memory on the board or if they use little micro SD cards and stuff. And so I have like an iFixit yeah. screwdriver that I just use to break things open. I gotta say, it's, it's always nice to have a, uh, a supporter, a sponsor that gets you. <laughs> and iFixit gets us. I appreciate that. Now, you know who else gets us? Who? Routers. Oh yeah. yeah! So I see we've got some links. Yeah, we've got some, we've got we got a little bit of the old uh, the old hotness. Now, if you go to the project product shot, this was the previous gold standard for everyone running DDWRT. You know, that is that, like that the open source iconic router. Yeah. This look. I think I got this like maybe six, five, six years ago. Well, what's the what's the date on this? Uh, yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah, it was a while back. <laughs> this is one of the original WRT 54Gs, the one of the one of the first versions. Now, the nice thing about this router is that it came with enough firepower to to make it run DDWRT, and that's that open source software uh, project that we've been running on the show. Anytime we want to do something with IP tables mm -hmm. or you know DNS mask, it's it runs on lower end routers, but gives you some of those high end routing features. Right. Very cool, and also very very geeky. Now, here's the problem. Although I love the, the DDWRT on a Linksys WRT54G, yeah. it's kind of limited, right? Because yeah. you're, you're kind of shoehorning full source router software. Into in, like a little body. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's, tiny. Just, it's so tiny, it's kind of plasticky, it couldn't really handle it. It looks like you have the mothership uh, that it came from well, sitting on the desk right now. This one was 2.4 gigahertz only, so that's mm -hmm. uh, 802.11bg. Uh, and I don't think this one even did N. Uh, it also did only 10100 ports. So you had a 10100 port for the, the WAN, the wide area network, and mm -hmm. four 10100 ports for the LAN. And it also had four megabytes of flash storage, which was a lot for back there. Four megabytes was a lot. I bet. And 16 megabytes of system memory, but then on later versions, they dropped it down to eight. Oh, okay. Yeah, so... Yeah. It, it might be time to retire the it, old guy. It might be time to retire. These are great. In fact, there's one running under the desk right now. It powers the know-how desk. But Linksys has the new hotness. Now, Ooh. if you go to my project shot for this one, <laughs> this, and go ahead and run the run the B-roll. This is the new Linksys WRT1900AC. Now, Looks check like this out. It's 2.4 and 5 gigahertz simultaneously. So there's two separate radios in there. You can run both at the same time. There are a lot of routers out there that will let you run either 2.4 or 5. Mm -hmm. This will let you run them concurrently. It also has 802.11 A, B, G, N, and AC. That's the new wireless standard. It has beam forming tech, which means it can use its four different antennas to do the, this creative interference so that you can, you can steer a beam towards a particular device. <laughs> I know, that's, that's, uh, I, that's pretty cool. I love that, that's, that's always so cool. Now, four gigabit LAN ports and one gigabit WAN port, so you're gonna get line speed for, for most of your networks. It also has, and this is, this is where it gets crazy, crazy wonderful. Mm -hmm. Instead of, uh, I think it was something like a, a 128 hertz processor, or kilo, a megahertz processor in the original WRT. This one has a dual core 1.2 gigahertz CPU. It also comes Power. with 128 megabytes of flash versus four. four. And it comes with 256 megabytes of DDR3 system memory versus 16 and eight. Okay, so a little bit of an upgrade. It's a little bit of an upgrade, but I mean, just feel it. This thing, it's got, it's got half to it. I mean, it, yeah, this is kind of plasticky. This is the old hotness. This is the new hotness. Now, it's it looks not... like a spaceship. It does. Actually, Burke said, 
It looks mean. It does. It's making an angry face it's, at it's, me. It's, it's angry. It's angry. <laughs> no, but Burke was saying how he liked it just because it had that mean profile. And it is it is a little on the pricier side. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask next. Yeah, you're, you're looking, you know, two. 50. 250? 250. Actually, that's not as much as I thought it was yeah. going to be. Yeah. 250 and how I mean, how long do you think this router will last you for? Well, I mean, when you think of the fact that we're still using this, you know, 6 7 years later. Right. So and that's if so If you limited. can use this for even half that time. Yeah, it, it's a deal. And but here's the big thing. Okay, so all those specs are great. There's a lot of routers with those specs. But this is this is what's different about uh, the new hotness from Linksys. What's that? Uh, remember they, they were recently uh, acquired by Belkin. They've designed this to run open source. Oh, cool. So we hacked these devices, these old routers, to, to right. get they DDWRT. They weren't meant to do that. They weren't meant to, they, they were meant to run the proprietary software that Linksys had created. This has been designed from the ground up to give you the horsepower, the memory, the processing, and all those external inputs. And this thing has USB 3.0, it has eSATA, to give you all the things so that you could really go to town with DDWRT or any other open source routing software. Yeah, well, I mean, even looking through the little vents on this thing, it looks like a little PC in there. It's got fans and everything. I know. Well, I mean, that's essentially what it is, right? Yeah. This is a Linux PC inside of a router or a router chassis. And, uh, you know, this the, the inclusion of eSATA and USB 3 actually makes me think, I, I really want to test this. I want to run it through its paces and see what kind of transfer speeds I'm going to get over this thing. Because there are a lot of routers that allow you to plug in external storage devices, but the speed isn't all that great. I mm. think with these ports, I can actually pull off some, uh, some serious transfers. I mean, we should probably do some gaming with it too, just to test out the wireless. No, there. there will be no gaming on this router. No gaming? No. <laughs> No, that, that would be a, a shame. Of, there's there's going to be a lot of gaming. <laughs> now, we are going to run this through its paces. I mean, as we are wont to do on Know How, we, we're not satisfied with a PR paper. I mean, no. what I just described to you are all the specs, and specs are great, and the promise is great, but we're for the next couple of weeks, the next couple of months, we're actually going to run this in a real network. And if it passes muster, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be the new hotness that's going to power the Know How desk. And if it doesn't pass... Then, my fix it kit's coming yeah, out. Then they, I we're fix gonna it and see what it looks like on the inside. Actually, I'm probably gonna do that anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You would. Now, Brian, we've had a, an action back show. We we gave yeah, we, was a lot. We gave a lot a description of heart bleed hard bleed and I think people can actually understand. How to patch up your heart bleed. And also because it's got jelly beans. Yeah, anytime we can in, <laughs> involve candy beans. on the show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now whenever someone eats a jelly bean, they'll be like, okay, I give you one jelly bean and you give it right back and I'll yeah, and then and then I don't give you sixty three thousand nine hundred ninety nine. Yeah. But we've we've also told people how they can get some free performance back from their Windows PC, and we've shown them probably the next uh, standard some for open router. source routing. Is, yeah, is is yeah, because you were drooling a little I was bit when drooling. you were uh, describing yeah. it. I haven't been excited by a router for a long time. <laughs> I mean, routers. Are I don't kinda, think many people are usually, no, but, but this, this is kind of cool. I, I want to crack this thing open. This one is cool. This is cool. Now, so uh, that's a lot. Where can the folks find out information about those projects and those things that we show them? Well, Padre, they can find that on twit.tv slash kh, where we keep all our episodes and our show notes, which we will have links for, like, the episodes I mentioned, where Leo goes really into depth with LastPass, um, which was a special, and Security Now with Steve Gibson, and then all those links of where to download software or any of our notes, you will find those on the show page. Yeah, yeah. Now, you could also email us, but we don't answer emails. So no. instead of doing that, why don't you go ahead and, uh, well, follow us on Twitter, right? Yeah, I think that's, that's probably a good place the, to Yeah, start. actually, if you follow us on Twitter, you'll be able to ask us for things that you want on future shows. Right you'll be able away. to make snarky comments, and we, we normally respond, especially him. But uh, you can find me, twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. And I'm at underscore, well, at cranky underscore hippo. Yeah, so. but our our prize possession is not our show notes. Our prize possession is not our Twitter accounts. Our prize mm -hmm. possession is our Google Plus community. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, the shining gold trophy that is six thousand plus. plus active users. I am I am oh, always man. blown away by the the kind of discussion that goes on in there. Just this morning, someone posted this this question. He wants to build an immersion rig, so he wants to take a computer and put it in like mineral oil or some other non-conductive oh, liquid. Oh yeah, yeah, that would be cool. I remember doing those back in the day. You know this. This is why I love this community. They're, they're just always tinkering, and I like tinkerers. I'm actually a little afraid. I've been going through the community, and there's some awesome projects. And you know how I, I, we do the projects, and we ask people, okay, like show us your version. They're a lot better 
at some of those yeah. than the things that we've made. And I'm like, maybe I shouldn't have asked people to do those projects, yeah. but there's some cool stuff on there. Speaking of those projects, next week is a feedback episode. So we're going to be going through the Google Plus page. We're going to be pulling out the best questions, the best projects. We're going to show them right here. So be sure to get your comments, your input into our Google Plus page. Make sure you get your questions in there so that we can answer you up next week. Sounds good. Sounds good to me? Yeah. All right. Good episode. Well, uh, until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasare. I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know it, go do it. <laughs>